Hello and welcome to Board Online, Board Offline. Today we are, for the love of God, finally starting our Dungeon Universalis instructional series. This is an instructional series that I honestly should have started building out a while ago, or I did start building it out a while ago. I should have started filming it a while ago. I, uh, for personal and professional reasons, like uh, I have fallen behind on the channel. It, it's just I had to take a back seat to, to other things. And, and so, you know, we're at one point I was putting out around 10 to 12 videos a month. I'm putting out about four a month now. And so my timeline and my backlog has gotten ridiculous. Uh, to the point that I'm not even uh, taking in new games anymore to create these. Finally getting to this one though. I'm very, very excited. This is a very complex game. Uh, more out of the, because it allows you to do so much and to use the system in so many different ways. Uh, for that reason, we're actually gonna, it, we're gonna break this series up into nine parts, I think. Uh, today we're just gonna cover character creation then we'll cover up, co cover up. We'll cover the setup in part two. Uh, just kind of the general setup rules. Then in part three, we'll cover the turn. Part four will be combat and magic. Part five will cover the dark player, which uh, in the game you can have one player controlling the bad guys, everybody else controlling the good guys. Uh, but then in part six, we'll cover the. Uh, the automated dark player or the AI dark player. I'm not sure what the A stands for there. Let's, let's, let's look at that real quick. Uh, 54, 54. The artificial dark player. There we go. We'll be covering the artificial dark player in part uh, six. Part seven, we're going to go through equipment, elements, and companions. Part eight will be quests and campaigns. And part nine, will be the advanced rules, which are back here in the very back of this rule book. So you can see, we're gonna have quite a bit of time to, together with this game. Uh, you know, it's gonna take a while to get through it all, but we are absolutely going to do it. This is our focus now, and I'm so excited. In Dungeon Universalis, you can create a custom hero according to your taste or interest, enhancing or diminishing their racial features and specializing them as you wish with any of the classes available. The first thing you'll do is go through the 25 race cards and select which race you want your hero to be. We'll go with elves for now. The race card indicates the hero's alignment here. This symbol is for good heroes, while this symbol is neutral and this symbol is evil. It should be noted that neutral heroes can be in any group. However, good heroes and evil aligned heroes cannot be in the same group. Down here you see the skill that the hero begins with. In this case, it's the skill Sharp Senses. But you can see some heroes will begin with multiple skills. In this case, Sharp Senses and Tracker. And in this case, Stealth, Small, and Pathfinder. This number indicates the fortune points a hero has because of their race. Certain races will be more fortunate or more favored by the gods than others. And then this area here and here determine the racial attributes of a hero as well as the limits to improve them. The left column indicates the minimum for this particular race in those attributes while the right column indicates the maximum achievable potential. And to the right of that, you'll see these yellow-green dots next to each of the attributes. These indicate the number of development points that must be spent in order to increase the value of each attribute by one point. When initially creating a character, each player has eight development points they may use to increase the attributes of their hero. However, it should be noted that some classes will boost attributes of a hero automatically. Some classes may also limit the development of a hero's attribute. It should also be noted that while on your character sheet here, you'll see you've got a one for one for each of these symbols here. Uh, you've got your the fortune symbol here. You've got dexterity and perception here, and those don't show up on here, and that's because there are no minimum or maximum values for those attributes. 
These two can only be enhanced by skills. You'll also note that natural armor doesn't have a max value, and that's because it cannot be changed, and also fortune cannot be changed. Most races, as you can see here, have two dashes for their mana, min and max values. But you'll see here that some races will have a numerical value of plus two. This indicates that one development point may be invested in increasing their initial and maximum number of mana points by one. They may be increased up to plus two if two development points are invested. This allows the generic limitations of wizards to be exceeded. Next, the player will need to choose the class for their character. In this case, let's go with Scout. Next, players will want to choose a class for their character. It should be noted first that there are three groups of classes. Fighters with this symbol, Explorers with this symbol, and Spellcasters with this symbol. Fighters will, as you might expect, specialize in combat. Explorers will specialize in exploration and subterfuge. And spellcasters will specialize in the use of magic forces to a greater or lesser extent. These symbols across the top indicate the difficulty with which the class will learn new skills. The lion face here indicates combat skills. The book indicates scholarly and leadership skills. and the hooded figure here indicates exploration and subterfuge. And we'll discuss more about that later in this video. The player will take their initial skill card indicated here, in this case, Eagle Eye, and the player will make sure to note of any advantages or disadvantages. Advantages being indicated with the yellow circle and disadvantages, the red circle. Now, it should be noted that Dungeon Universalis really provides the ability to customize so much of the game and make all kinds of combinations with the races and the classes. However, if you want some guidance, this area on page 77, Combinations, lists off the various races and the recommended classes to go with those races. So for instance, with Amphibians here, you can see it's recommended Warrior, Scout, Ranger, Wizard, Animist, or Sorcerer. And with the spellcasters, it actually gives recommendations for what types of magic they should be using. Whereas if you went with an infernal, it recommends just either warrior or scout. It should also be noted that if you ever have a conflict between your chosen class and your chosen race, any sort of conflict involving the attributes or skills or anything like that, you should always choose the most restrictive option. So since the player has eight development points to begin with, we might, for instance, take this stat here and change it from a 4 to a 5, which will cost 3 development points, as you see there. And then maybe this stat from a 3 to a 4, which will leave us with 2 more development points. And so maybe the final one... Uh, let's go with this one. We'll change this from a 3 to a 4. And there we go. Heroes must now draw the skill cards that correspond to their race and class that they chose. Keep in mind, there are four different decks of skill cards. You have your combat skills, you have your scholarly and leadership skills, your exploration and subterfuge skills, and your nature skills. In this case, the Elv race has the nature ability Sharp Senses, and the Scout starts with the subterfuge ability Eagle Eye. In the game, you may hear skills referred to as either natural or professional skills. The professional skills are these three here, these three types of skills, and of course, this would be the natural type of skill. Some races will allow the learning of an extra professional skill at the moment of the character's creation. And of course, as the hero acquires experience, they will be able to learn new professional skills. However, it's important to keep in mind that a hero will only ever be able to learn twice as many new professional skills as their intelligence level. 
At the bottom of each professional skill card are the symbols of the classes that can learn this particular skill. If the symbol of a class is not included, it means it's impossible for a character with that class to learn it. So in this case, we're looking for this symbol here to see if the scout can learn these skills. And so for Iron Will, you can see there's the symbol there. For Eagle Eye, it's there. And for Hardy, it's there. So in all of these cases, the scout is able to learn this skill. Meanwhile, an animist would be able to learn Iron Will or Eagle Eye, but not Hardy. If the race card chosen by the player reads that the hero starts with a skill of their choice, as you can see here, that skill must still comply with that class symbol restriction we just mentioned. Each newly created character is now given an initial budget of 20 coins. Making sure to also observe the limitations of each class, players will decide which is the equipment their character will start with. Heroes may even acquire a pet if they have the Taming Animals skill or hire a mercenary. A hero is not allowed to share any part of their initial budget with other characters. This symbol here indicates a rare object. During character creation, a character will be able to acquire any rare object they wish, as long as it fits within their budget, of course. And the usual role is not required. To determine how much weight a character can carry, they must sum their strength and vitality, so 9, and multiply that by 2, so 18. This limitation applies to the weight of all equipment transported, including armor. So let's check to see if we have enough carry capacity. 3 plus 1 is 4, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 12. So we still have six carrying capacity. There are also certain limits on the number of objects that a character carries. So for instance, they can carry a single shield or buckler. They can carry up to two light or heavy armors. This excludes helmets, greaves, or bracelets. And up to five weapons. A hero may also carry a maximum of 30 coins. If the hero is carrying any precious gems or similar small valuables, they are considered to have a weight of one, unless otherwise specified. Mercenaries and any animal with the skill mount, as you see right here, can carry equipment and coins with the same limitations as a hero. That is to say, the hero will be able to use them to transport part of their belongings. If a character ever carries more weight than they are allowed to, they will suffer the stunned condition. When a character is stunned, they get a minus one penalty to all of their attributes except for natural armor, mana, and vitality. They also are unable to run. This will occur, as I said, if they carry more weight than the maximum allowed or if they break any of the other equipment limitations, including the amount of gold they're carrying. If a character exceeds two or more of these limitations, or they more than double any one limitation, they will not only suffer stunned, but they will not be able to move or perform any actions during their activation. Heroes will gain experience points for accomplishing a mission on their first attempt and also for scoring more achievement points than the Dark player. It's important to realize that knocked out heroes will not gain any experience. Players will also find other ways to gain experience points, such as combat schools, libraries, and other locations. Heroes can then use three accumulated experience points in one of the following upgrades. Skill learning, development points, increasing in fortune, or learning spells. To engage in skill learning, the player will roll 1d6 and check the result. In this case, we roll a 1, which means the player will have to choose a combat skill to learn. It should be noted, though, if the last time this hero used skill learning, they also learned a combat skill, they can ignore this result and choose whichever type of skill they want and choose whichever type of professional skill they want. The player would also do the same if it was simply not possible for them to learn any of the skills available in the type indicated. For three experience points, as we mentioned, the hero can get one development point, which they can then immediately invest in increasing an attribute according 
to the number of development points seen here as normal. It should be noted that this development point must be spent immediately, which means that if a character wants to upgrade, for instance, this attribute here, it requires two development points, so they would actually need six experience points to achieve that one. It should be noted that increasing attributes by experience can be done once at a maximum for each attribute. For three experience points, the hero can increase their fortune by one. This is a permanent increase. And this can be done at most twice. Also, any hero that has the invulnerable ability is large in size or starts with only two or three initial fortune points can only increase them by one point. A hero's initial value point will be 10. As they gain experience points and invest them in improvements, their attributes and skills will increase and with them, their value points. It should also be noted that spellcaster heroes are considered apprentices until they reach a value point of 15. And then once they finally reach a value point of 30, they will be considered arch mages. And there you go. That's everything you need to know for character creation for Dungeon Universalis. Be sure to come back next time when we cover the setup for Dungeon Universalis. And uh, I, I really, I'm really excited, as I said at the beginning, to be digging into this game and can't wait for y'all to join me for this journey. And until next time, if you're bored online, bored offline.